Uh, we have quite a distinguished panel here today. Francesca Senegal, James Faff, and Tim Clark. Thank you so much, Malcolm. And thanks for the kind introduction again. And of course, for hosting us today. Um, I guess a good place to start as any is at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So, James, perhaps you could talk a little bit more about the genesis for Alex story. and me and in its uh, first iteration. Um, so basically the, the story of Alex and me begins in, in Hamburg, where I, where I met her on the street quite randomly. She was um, full of energy, she was very open. And at that time in my life, I, I'd, I'd come from Glasgow to Hamburg and I was really enjoying living in this very free city. And we became close almost immediately. In fact, I think the, the first night we, we in fact, the first, after the first day we met, I think by that night we were already a, an item. So she was a very, very powerful woman. And we were together for a while in Hamburg. And then for, I can't quite remember the reason why she went back. She's Canadian. She went back to Canada. And um, it was decided at some point that I would like to go and go and visit her. And my, the original plan was just simply to take a trip to Canada and hang out in Canada. And this is really the, the, the genesis of the story. And at some point when I was in Canada, we decided to make this, this journey together um, for fun, effectively. Um, so we, we undertook a very quick strip journey, if you like. I think it was two and a half weeks or perhaps three weeks. And we made this, this very rapid journey together. At this time, I'd already been working as a photographer, so I, I knew my way around a camera, if you like. But I, I'd only begun to take pictures for myself. So basically, I was doing commercial jobs, putting my camera down, getting another commercial job, putting my camera down. So I wasn't really taking pictures for myself. And when I went to Canada, um, one of the most important things was that I wasn't going to take my camera on, on this trip. So it wasn't... I didn't have this in my idea, and I can always remember Alex being absolutely appalled about this and demanding that I took my camera with me. So basically I took my camera with me and um, she encouraged me to take many pictures of her. And, um, and I think the, the important thing for me in this is that this was an absolute unique moment because the pictures you see here are absolutely three pictures with absolutely no idea of, of making a book out of them or let alone a show. So this is an absolutely natural set of pictures you have here. And as soon as I came back, of course, when I looked at the, the images, I really loved what the, the pictures I'd made. And from that second on, it was never innocent in that way. Every other picture I took, I thought maybe I use this um, another time for some other reason. So for me, this is really important, quite a unique moment. Should we pass that? Ah, pass. And how about you, Francesca? How, how did you encounter this work for the first time? When did you meet James? And uh, how did you come to be involved in the project? So I was working with this, uh, on this exhibition uh, of Dolson Anatomy, and that, that was totally different. And Lorenzo told me, please have a look at this image because it's really nice. They are really nice. And James is trying since many years to make a book. He wants to make a book. So I saw the images. Uh, he showed me just uh, 40 images. And uh, I liked the picture. I saw something classic, uh, a classic beauty, totally different. And then, uh, yeah, we started to work together and uh, I realized that this project was really interesting because uh, uh, I was already working with the archival material, uh, like a curator, and uh, that time I had the opportunity to work with the archival material with uh, a photographer alive. <laughs> so, <laughs> normally you work with archives sure. with that yeah. person. And, the nice thing is that uh, the photographer, uh, artist, uh, at that time photographer, we can say, yes. um, the work with his archive could uh, reappropriate uh, his uh, archive 
And this for me was uh, something special to see an archive that could become a source uh, of inspiration for uh, uh, James uh, and uh, to become in this way an artist. Uh, what uh, we realize uh, is uh, everything that uh, after have been made uh, by James, uh, all the intervention he did uh, on his picture, even after and now, are already pre-existing in his uh, notebook, in his uh, original things. Uh, so what was really interesting... So the original notebooks from the road trip in 1998. Yeah. yeah. So you notice this pattern, this kind of visual idiom, yeah. brush strokes, expressive marks, texts. Yeah. I mean, all, all of this, the stuff that's in the book now all kind of pre-existed in my workbooks and journals. So I'd already been experimenting with it, but I hadn't really carried it forward in, into this book. In actual fact, what I should say is that um, I don't have a formal art school background. So basically I was at City of Glasgow College, which was quite a straightforward um, commercial course. So although I'd been, after, after the trip with Alex, I started to really keep many, many notebooks of everything and I made many, many trips um, during the period directly after I met Alex, which is something I'm sure we'll talk about. But basically, I was always experimenting, writing notes, cutting out pictures, and looking at stuff. But by the time I met Francesca, I had an absolutely very classic layout for Alex and me, which was just horrible, wasn't it? Yeah. You know? So it was chronological. I think it was based on William Eggleston's book. That's why he was 48 pictures. So it was really, really fortunate that I met Francesca. And the thing was that once again, maybe I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but the, the great thing about working with Francesca, another woman in my life is that I've been so influenced by her and basically working with Francesca is a little bit like going to art school, although much harder. So, <laughs> so she basically took the project in hand, but let me work away. But she also introduced me to a lot of art concepts and the ideas of thinking and she also protected me often from making horrible mistakes yeah so this is a set for me this was a really important new collaboration mm. i guess clearly it's a really productive collaboration mm. also very symbiotic as well mm. so on the one hand you're bringing your expertise and work and experience of archives but it's also a dream Yes. for a curator as well, yes. to work with a contemporary artist yeah. who perhaps is not necessarily so uptight and so as to not let their archive no. be reworked, which yeah. is a real... I guess my thinking is, why do you feel it, it needed this contemporary response? I think it's... I had an idea in my head that um, if you bring forward an archive from 20 years ago that are just simply black and white pictures or or colour C types, the current climate, it would possibly be difficult for a book like that to get traction. I mean, we really need to, photography's moved beyond that, you know? So, I mean, you principally, this, uh, this uh, intervention or reappropriation manifests itself through uh, expressive paintbrush strokes, yeah. the written word as well. But of course, throughout the, the exhibition and the book, in terms of the straight photography in the, in the documentary mode, or what we might refer to more specifically as the subjective documentary mode, we see um, all the tropes of uh, on-the-road photography. Right? Um, so we see uh, car interiors, highways, gas stations, bars and telephone booths. Uh, so on the, you have that level of images but then also embedded within that are really um, vibrant portraits of your protagonist, of, of Alex herself. So I guess just referring back to my previous question as well, uh, why it needed this contemporary response, mm. uh, what, what does that act of reworking the images represent for you both? Well, for me personally, it's, it's actually, I mean, obviously because it's been 20 years since this trip was made, which is a really interesting way to work. I mean, every project I'm working with has got this, this time lag to it. So basically the contemporary 
approach to it is simply to add some more feeling to it is what I'm trying to do. So I'm taking the photograph and I'm using, I'm not using paint particularly in an illustrative way. I'm trying to find a reason for doing it. So, I mean, you've mentioned several times the distance, the, uh, yeah. the amount of time that's passed between the book being released and when the uh, actual body of work was shot. And, and obviously, as we know, memory is a huge, huge topic and integral to photography. Um, to the way we think about photography, to the way we make sense and, and understand it. Um, it's also, as a storytelling device, it's also instrumental to the way narratives uh, are constructed and the way history is represented. So, I mean, what role does, does memory play in your creative process, um, particularly in assembling this body of work? Yeah, I, th I think what's, what's interesting for me with the, the question of, of, of memory is, is, is how it, I mean, it changes. This is the point, I mean, your memory, things fade and, and actually you're just left with the, with, with the photographs, do you know what I mean? So basically, as, as time goes on, when I'm trying to trying to respond to memory, it becomes more difficult to remember exactly what happened and, and how it was, you know. So initially, Alex and me started off as a project that was absolutely, I mean, it is actually 95%, I'm sure, factual. But the, the fading memory allows a little space as time goes on for me to reimagine some things. So the percentage slides a, a little bit. So... I mean, the memory fades, I add something, you know? Yeah, it's, it's, no, it's, it, yeah, it's a circular world. And it's also, I, I like to think of it as this project as, a, as your collaboration. Yes, yeah, a collaboration with Alex, collaboration yeah. with Francesco on the one hand, but it's also a collaboration with your younger self. Mm. Yeah, exactly, yes. Um, perhaps what we're coming on to is, is, is the role of obsession as well. Mm -hmm. you know? Perhaps we could talk uh, a little bit about the role of obsession in, in artistic research. Um, yeah, sure. I, you. Well, I would just say that, I mean, my, my obsession with Alex shouldn't be um, miscalculated with the idea that, that, that I would like to be with Alex or that some residue love for Alex. This, this is not the case. But certainly, I realized that this archive I had is something really, really nice. And I mean, in keeping with many photographers or artists, we all strive to, to have a publication. I mean, I, I think I know many people who want to have a, a photo book, but having a, a photo book is actually a, a very, um, a, to have a good photo book is a really, really difficult thing. It's, it's not easy at all, do you know what I mean? So I had this idea in my head that, um, that there was something there, but the obsession probably started with the experimenting or reprinting hundreds of pictures of Alex or repainting them again and again and again. And if you look through my, my notebooks, you just keep on seeing more pictures of Alex repainted this, Alex cut up, Alex in every way. So, I mean, this was one obsession, but my character, I mean, in my life, um, I've had obsessions with, with, with Led Zeppelin. I've had a very well-known truck obsession. I've, I mean, I've had so many things that I've become interested in photography as well. So in terms of, of artistic research, I mean, it was just, I was going back and back and back looking for the way, but the, the really important lesson that I learned about making a photo book, which is one of the, the biggest problems for anyone making a photo book, is that you need someone to talk to about your photo book because to make a photo book without a dialogue with someone you trust is a very dangerous thing. In a way, the concept of obsession mm. was already a little bit in a book because we had these uh, with the white pages yeah. uh, where uh, James was uh, uh, painting and really I was looking through many, many pages say, no, this brush is not enough good, look here, no. We were discussing about... Uh, For six white, months, six months. So it took six months so, to... Okay, so I don't know who is more crazy, me or James, but uh, um, this was to find uh, 
a language in a way, and uh, this is uh, for us uh, even the wabi sabi art. Uh, I don't know if you know what is wabi sabi. Is uh, this uh, Japanese uh, art that um, means, imperfection? Yeah, about imperfection, about uh, embrace uh, your imperfection in your life, and this uh, I think was. Uh, uh, the biggest message uh, between me and James uh, uh, to keep uh, all the dust uh, of uh, the picture, all uh, the imperfection yeah, of the relics, everything. All the yeah, but this was this was one of the biggest challenges because I came from a commercial background where everything mm -hmm. should be perfect, and Francesca worked really hard to break this down from me. If you understand what I mean, it was really difficult for me just to let go. And now I'm quite free, but at this point I was much more, much more difficult for me just to... Just, just to go back to about the, the notebooks again, I think the tremendous relevancy to the project. You know? And I think each page is sort of pervaded with kind of uh, an echo of James's sort of intimate and uh, visceral attachment to his subject. I think um, they feel like... Uh, really feel like translation of a thought into vision. Yeah. Um, and, and similarly, I guess, there's a, it, yes, obsession, but it's also a sense of kind of personal urgency, mm. Mm. Right? Um, and which comes forth really explicitly in your writing, which is something I enjoy as well, immensely. Um, and that continues across your journal, the book, and indeed the show here, the, the role of text. Yeah. Uh, and it's great when you when you peruse those journals, you see James kind of insisting, resisting, resuming, repeating, even kind of rewriting. So you, it sort of reveals this this discovery, this process in which to observe the subject. Um, and in a sense, I was thinking about this on the train on the way up. Is um, your your kind of we could say your your writings. Uh, reflect your photographs in a structural way as well, maybe. No, they're fragments, yes. which in turn are, are, are composed of other fragments. Um, and I, I think that's a really nice way to handle this, this subject of love. It's like pieces of a puzzle give this impression of being too large, too complex to, to comprehend. In a way, I think I think just to say that's one of the problems of working with a project like this is because it is so shattered, it is so fragmented, it is so imperfect that I could approach it a different way every day I wake up. So, so this 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 period of quite prolific travelling, then yeah. a lot of it was well, you've been to many places, obviously, but the backdrop for this project is is America, no. Mm. Um, and I, and I find it interesting, the time, you know, 1998, it's kind of on the cusp when everything was about to change. Three years later, we have September 2001. We, we will know what happened there, yeah. the catastrophic events. Clinton and, was Yeah, the exactly. Yeah. yeah. So there is a, a slight political undertow to the work. There's certain images that refer to Clinton's mm. trials. Kind of snippets of newspaper covers, things yeah. like that. And then and Natasha Christia wrote quite beautifully about this in, the, in her essay as well. She talks about how this kind of new millennium uh, was abruptly affected by, or abruptly affected history's panorama, and that to a great extent our kind of faith towards images and, and the way uh, we perceive and consume them. Um, so, yeah, I, I remember what Natasha said. She said, America in September 1998 offers the set for a minor story with unexpected larger connotations before the crashing and demolition of expectations and the beginning of a new era of neoconservatism when the two protagonists of this story followed their own destinies and paths. Yeah. And I'm, I'm quite curious about the fact that this, this project, the book, which you, you, I mean, if I understand correctly, you intended it initially as a gift Yes. To Alex, right? Yes, yes. Um, but now it's sort of take, take on a slightly different life. Yes, it's taken on a completely different life. What happened when, when this gift, I wanted to make this book as a, 
as a gift, as a, as a tribute to Alex. Um, when this went horribly wrong, basically this, this concept of a, of a gift, and this is maybe one of the most interesting and controversial um, topics of the, of, of the whole book. So in, in essence, I mean, Alex knew it. We, I'd worked with these images for 16 years. And um, it's important for you to understand that Alex really loves these pictures very, very much. And she also worked with me and Francesca on, on when we were making this book. But what she'd forgotten to do was to draw attention to the fact we're making our book to her partner. And um, her partner um, was somebody who, well, she'd complained to me for many years about her partner for for over two years. But her circumstances meant that she was, I suppose, under his control to a greater or lesser experience. So on the, on the very eve of, of publication, she asked me not to publish the book. And this is when things get really uh, quite difficult for me. Because I think it's fair to say that I was really upset with this for a long time, for three solid months. I had absolutely no idea how to handle this situation. So in the end, I decided to go ahead and publish it. I went against her wish to publish this, and I, I told her exactly that I would carry the, the, the project on. And this decision was, um, it's of course an imperfect decision. There was no right or wrong in this, but I considered it very carefully, and I considered many, many factors. So we never spoke again. So this for me was like a, a personal tragedy because I, I really lost somebody who I spoke to about photography every single day. I mean, I lost my muse, I lost my best friend, um, and, and I had absolutely so much Facebook chatter about it. it was, and, and at that time, my honest emotion was one of embarrassment. I was actually embarrassed about this being out there. This was the, I wasn't scared, I was, I was embarrassed. And I realized that this book was going to a lot of small publishing houses, a lot of really nice um, small operations that run book, bookshops. And I really didn't want these people to suffer the, the torrent of abuse that I'd received from, from Alex's partner. So I decided that it was time to talk about it. So basically I posted on Facebook and all my media channels um, just exactly what the situation was and the choice that I'd made and that I was going to carry on with the project. And this was a really important moment for me because somehow the very next morning when I woke up, I began the process of not really caring what people thought about me and my, my personal life. And this is when I began to be really free in my work. This was the moment when I was free because I know we can conceptualize the idea of being free with your work, but actually walking the line and doing it and taking the flag is a different thing. So although I still um, get very upset when I'm attacked, the next day I'm okay about it because this is a decision I made and it's any artist who does heartfelt work will come up against this at one point, that people will be annoyed. And now this makes me stronger, makes me more free. So this was a big moment for me. And we haven't spoken since. I, I think what's happened is that um, as a family, that she sat down for partner, I guess. And um, I think they just said, okay, we just, we never talk about this again. So I, I never spoke to it again. But I would just like to say something that um, one, one reviewer, um, Catherine Pahar, I think said something really nice about it. Let me read it to you, okay? Because it's even uncomfortable for me, but it's, it says, in fact, James is still coming to terms with his decision. Alex is gone from his life. He wants a reconciliation one day. In 10 years, maybe it will be the right time. If there had been any violence, he says, between Alex and her partner, he would have never published. But he lives, he admits, with the possibility of violence triggered or intensified by his own decisions. Alex's silence keeps this possibility alive always. Yes, James says he weighted this against his own investment in the book. 
And to say he is, he is not her keeper is, he knows, is no absolution. But to withdraw Alex and me would, I think, have made James complicit with her partner, who conflated Alex with her, with her image and policed, and perhaps still polices both. That Alex and me exists means that Alex exists cigarettes in hand on the road in 1998, belonging as she does to no one. So for me, this was an act of defense to, to Alex, you know? And, um, and for those who criticize me for this decision, that's okay. Yeah. And I would like even to say something about uh, the fact that yeah, I'm a, a woman mm. and I've been involved in editing and working with these images. And uh, I always try to make her uh, vision really intimate and delicate. Uh, we never show anything mm, strong or that was not uh, respecting her yeah. for me. So we've got that out now, yeah? Oh, yeah, I mean, it's a beautiful love poem to her. You know? She's depicted mm. at her best, in her prime, mm. on the road, and then for us as viewers, it enables us to experience yeah. that vicariously. Um, so, I mean, it's quite a poignant note to end on, but yeah. as, as is penned on the, the front of the book, the story, unfinished. that relationship is, is unfinished. So I take some questions from, from you in the audience. Anybody's got any questions or comments? Go on, please. So, did Alex know about the show in the end? Um, I, and what I did was I wrote to Alex to say that this project was, was carrying on. So, I don't know how, what her interpretation of the word project is, but um, for, sh for sure she knew that I was carrying on the project. But she doesn't know about this part. I don't think it's too difficult to find out about this. <laughs> yeah, I, as I said to you, I, I think that she made the right decision for her and her family. I think she sat down and I think her partner said to her, hey, listen, I don't like this. We forget about it. We never speak about it again, you know. But, um, but if she comes into my life, I'll be, I'll be talking about it. I mean, I hope one day she'll be sitting here because she hasn't right now got a voice to come back and, 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 and say something. And, and if she sent me a, a letter or something like that, for sure I would let everybody read it. Because she's also got a real story. So you wanted to collaborate with her for this project? We did, yeah, we did, we, we did collaborate with her actually on the project and, and she loves these pictures and we worked with her on the book. It was just simply that she, she hadn't mentioned it to her partner, so yeah. it was a really different, obviously he reacted really badly to it for whatever reasons, you know. Not an easy situation. Thanks, Malcolm. Last time I'll say it. <laughs> so, uh, yep, thanks again for thanks coming and thanks for the time.